What's up YouTube? It's your boy JP's on the keys and it's too easy. We're back with another video today. We have Napoleon's Marshals Part 3. This is a video that a lot of people have requested. So I figured I might as well get it out of the way and get it dropped. So y'all can have this video because I know you wanted it. But let's just go. <laughs> Terror Belly, Decus Pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French Marshal's baton. In France, the title of Marshal or Maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals. With expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Rémy Porte, former Chief Historian of the French Army. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brune, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jordan, Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, and Marmont. Thirteen. Marshal Saint Cyr. He is the best man among us in the line of defense, though I am superior to him in attack. Of course, you're not going to be better than Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> my man was like, he good, he he probably my best man, but he he not better than me though. I like I like the confidence though. I pre I like <laughs> Gouvion Saint Cyr was a gifted student who ran away from a miserable childhood to become an artist. A passionate republican, he embraced the French Revolution and later volunteered for military service. Though proud and aloof by nature, his republican politics and sharp intellect ensured he was elected captain of his company. His skill at drawing enemy positions then got him noticed by General Coustine, who gave him a job on his staff. During these turbulent early years of the revolution, Coustine was one of several generals who was punished for defeat with a trip to the guillotine. Saint-Cyr's instinctive grasp of warfare, brilliant planning and tactics won him promotion from volunteer to general of division in two years. An even more remarkable achievement as he'd had no formal military training. But his cold, analytical approach meant that he was always a respected leader rather than loved. After Got a question. Speaking of that, would you much rather be respected or loved. That's would you rather be loved or respected? That's my thing. Like, like, what what would you rather be? To be honest, for me, I'd rather be respected because I personally don't need people to to personally like me. But if you respect what I'm doing and you respect my efforts to try to do, like, like if you respect, if they respect him for trying to lead them in the right way, they don't necessarily have to like him. But it's like okay. I see what he's doing, I like what he's doing, like, I respect it, but of course I don't really mess with him as a person, but I like what he does. That's, that's a lot of things, that's a lot of things, because you, you can, you can, you can care less about the person, but you like what they do, you know what I mean, you, you respect what they do, you respect their, their art, you know, like, personally, like I said, I'm, I'm not a LeBron fan, but I respect his work ethic on the court. I respect that he's one of the best players in the league. I respect his skill. You know, I'm not I'm not a LeBron fan, but I respect it. You see, like you can respect something without necessarily liking something as well, you know. After five years service with the Army of the Rhine, he was sent to Italy. At the disastrous Battle of Novi, he commanded the French right wing, but skillfully extricated his troops from the debacle. 
The next year he was back on the Rhine, and won a brilliant victory over the Austrians at Dibrach. But a bitter dispute with his commander, General Moreau, encouraged rumours that Saint-Cyr was impossible to work with. Saint-Cyr believed soldiers should not meddle in politics, and did not support Napoleon's seizure of power in 1799. Nor did he show much enthusiasm for Napoleon's decision to crown himself Emperor five years later. How do you, again, also, how do you guys feel about like military-led states, like military coups? How do you feel about that? Personally, I feel like it doesn't it, it doesn't work. Cause look at look at what happened in Africa. Look at all the military coups that happened in Africa in the last fifty years. Look at all the military coups. And then military coups lead to dictatorships. Because then the, the general the general or the leader of the army is obviously going to assume power. So it's literally a dictatorship but with an army behind it. So there's no opposition. Just look at look at what happened now in the in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Like they're just now they're still fighting for democratic elections in twenty twenty. They're still fighting for democratic elections today. Like in this year, like now. That's ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? So obviously military led states are not the wave. They're not the way to go. I, like you see how it leads to dictatorship, absolute power, which is which is the worst form of government that can possibly be like, thought of for anybody. His political views cost him dearly. Saint-Cyr was sidelined for several years, while less able generals were made marshals. In 1805, he commanded French forces in central Italy. But when he was made subordinate to Marshal Massena, a man whom he personally detested, he returned to Paris, even when Napoleon threatened to have him shot for desertion. In 1808, Saint-Cyr was given command of a corps for the invasion of Spain, but his failure to take Girona meant he was relieved of command. Leaving in a fury before his replacement, Marshal Augereau, had arrived, he was nearly court-martialed again for desertion. Saint-Cyr's military talent, however, was not in doubt. In 1812, he was recalled for the Russia campaign, with command of 6th Bavarian Corps. This man, this man literally ran away from service twice, and they still called him back. <laughs> that goes to show you, man. They don't care. Hey, they, they need you, they'll come get you. That man literally deserted twice. And they still called him back like two or three years later. His role was to support Marshal Oudinot in guarding the northern flank of the French salient. When Wittgenstein's Russians attacked at Polotsk, Oudinot was wounded and Saint-Cyr took over command, turning probable defeat into a brilliant victory. For this achievement, Napoleon awarded Saint-Cyr his Marshal's Baton. But two months later, at a second Battle of Polotsk, Saint-Cyr was attacked by a larger Russian army, seriously wounded in the foot and forced to pull back. His injury meant he missed the worst horrors of the Russian retreat, but he contracted typhus early in 1813 and was sick for many months. Saint-Cyr returned to the Grande Armée in August, taking command of 14th Corps and the defence of Dresden. Incredibly, this was the first and only time that he worked directly alongside the Emperor, and both soon learned new respect for each other's abilities. Saint-Cyr's skilled defence of Dresden set the stage for Napoleon's great victory there later that month. So, so this man literally, this man deserted twice, he opposed Napoleon's rule. He, he, uh, what else? And, like, and, and then they still called him back after all this stuff. Like this man literally, op this man openly disagreed with the ruler of an entire nation. Deserted the army twice. I know I keep saying that, and they still call that just shows the respect that Napoleon had for him. See, like I'm saying, respect goes a long way. I'm sure Napoleon didn't like him, but he respected him. Like respect goes a long way when, like when you when you prove yourself 
like people respect what you do and people will will overlook their differences with you. Death penalty. He also struggled to enact military reforms in the face of royalist opposition, eventually resigning in disgust and retiring to his country estate. Marshal Saint-Cyr remains one of the great what-ifs of the Napoleonic Wars, an extremely able commander sidelined for his politics, who might well have proved one of Napoleon's very best marshals. 12. Marshal Udino. A decent fellow, but not very bright. <laughs> a decent fellow, but not very bright. I respect, you know, this man Napoleon is brutal. <laughs> brutal. Nicolas Udino ran away to join the army aged 17. But his father dragged him home three years later to help run the family business. When the revolution began, he volunteered for the National Guard and was promoted to Major. In the wars that followed, he served with the Army of the Rhine, always in the thick of the fighting, rapidly promoted and frequently wounded, a habit for which he became celebrated. In 1799, he was promoted to General of Division and sent to Switzerland to serve as General Massena's new Chief of Staff, a role he performed to perfection. Serving with General Brun in Italy, he led a cavalry charge against an Austrian battery at the Battle of Monzimbano, sabering gunners and capturing one cannon himself, a feat for which Napoleon awarded him a sword of honour. In 1805, the newly crowned Emperor Napoleon gave Oudinot command of an elite grenadier division formed from the tallest, strongest soldiers in the army. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Udino insisted on leading the division in person, despite having been shot in the thigh two weeks earlier. That man, that man Udino was a crash dummy. <laughs> that man was just absorbing bullets, didn't even care, just move forward. Just absorbing bullets. The boy got shot two weeks earlier, boy running in, just taking cannons. My, my man is just reckless. But... That's the type of people that he needed, that Napoleon needed. Just some reckless people that didn't care. They didn't care, they just wanted to fight. I like that attitude. His grenadiers were kept in reserve for most of the battle, but saw heavy fighting in the latter stages, as Napoleon completed the destruction of the Allied left wing. At the Siege of Danzig in 1807, General Oudinot's division had the unusual distinction of capturing an enemy warship, a British sloop, that had run aground trying to resupply the city. A month later, at Friedland, Udino and his grenadiers were under Marshal Land's command and played a crucial role holding up the Russian army, until Napoleon arrived to deal a decisive blow. During the 1809 war with Austria, Udino was wounded once more at the Battle of Aspern. When Marshal Lann died of his wounds, Napoleon chose Udino to succeed him as commander of 2nd Corps. He led his new corps with such success at Wagram six weeks later that Napoleon attributed victory to Massena and Udino. A week later, he became one of three new marshals. One for France, one for the army, one for friendship. Udino, the army's choice, fearless and much loved, a man whose courage inspired all around him. He later received an additional reward, the title Duke of Reggio. In 1812, Marshal Udino led Second Corps into Russia, but was wounded again at Polotsk, and handed over command to General Saint-Cyr. Ten weeks later, he was back with his corps, marching south to join up with Napoleon's army on its retreat from Moscow. Udino's men were shocked when they saw their old comrades from the main column. They looked more like fugitives than soldiers of the Grande Armée. Since Udino's second corps was in better shape than most, it formed the vanguard for the desperate crossing of the Berezina River. But the next day, in bitter fighting to hold the bridgehead against the Russians, Udino was shot from his saddle. 
He was carried back to a cottage with a serious gunshot wound, but then he and his party became surrounded by Cossacks. Oudinot asked for his pistols, and from his bed, aiming through an opening opposite, began firing at the Cossacks. Hmm. They were Yo, this man is literally a bullet sponge. Like, how many times has he been shot? This man is a bullet sponge. Like, I know he gotta be... I know his body had to be done after all them bullet holes. But rescued by friendly troops, just in time. Oudinot was back with the Grande Armée in Germany in 1813. In August, Napoleon ordered him to lead an advance on Berlin. But he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North at Grossbeeren. He then retreated in the wrong direction, causing Napoleon to remark, it's truly difficult to have less brains than the Duke of Reggio. In Udino's defense, he'd probably been given an impossible task. Insufficient men to take on a strong opponent, bad weather, terrible roads, and he himself unwell, possibly not yet recovered from his ordeal in Russia. Napoleon put Oudinot back where he was most effective, leading troops in combat under his close supervision. At Leipzig he commanded two divisions of the Young Guard, engaged in heavy fighting on the southern front for two days. Oudinot continued to serve the Emperor courageously and loyally as a corps commander in the final campaign of 1814. But in April he was one of several marshals to confront Napoleon with the reality of his position, and force his abdication. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, Oudinot refused to break his new oath to the monarchy, but declared neutrality, telling Napoleon since I shall not serve you, sire, I shall serve no one. You he, he, he a real one. You he a real Shout out to Udino. You a real one. You loyal. You know what I'm saying? I respect it. I respect his loyalty. I definitely, I respect it. You know what I mean? I, I respect it. This man was a bullet sponge and he was loyal to Napoleon. But this man, I like the fearlessness that he had. Like, he just, he just wrote... Cause I remember during the uh, the early series where I was watching the um the, the when Napoleon was doing when Napoleon was like in his prime ruling like I kept hearing Udinot's name a lot so I, so definitely definitely important like I know Wagram I remember Wagram Austerlitz Freeland all these and very important battles I remember his name coming up a lot. He continued to hold senior commands under the Bourbons. By one estimate. Oudinot was wounded 36 times in his military career, more than any other marshal. Here are just 20 that we found details for. A fellow officer who bathed with him at a spa after the war saw the scars on his body and observed... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Gunshot wound to the head, saber cut to the throat, grape shot wound, gunshot wound, gun, gunshot... How many... Holy moly! Oh my goodness! That man survived a gunshot wound to the noggin, and a gun, a, and he got sliced. That looks like the throat. My man got sliced in the throat, shot in the chest, been stabbed, cut, broke his leg. Oh my goodness! With him at a spa after the war, saw the scars on his body, and observed he was little more than a colander. Ironically. Udino was also one of the longest-lived marshals, dying aged 80 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. 11. Marshal Victor he was better than one might suppose, okay. Underrated. Claude Victor Perrin was an experienced soldier by the time of the French Revolution, a sergeant with eight years' service in the Grenoble Artillery Regiment. The Revolutionary Wars brought the opportunity for rapid promotion, and by 1793 he was commanding an infantry battalion at the Siege of Toulon. He led a daring night assault on British defences alongside the army's artillery chief, a young Major Bonaparte. Both men were wounded, but the attack was a success, and both were quickly promoted to Brigadier General. Victor served under General Bonaparte in Italy, and turned out to be a brilliant brigade commander. 
In 1800, he distinguished himself at the Battle of Marengo, where his command of the left wing won particular praise from Napoleon. But Victor did not hide his disapproval of Napoleon's quest for political power, and as a result, received relatively minor roles under the new regime. Same as, was it Saint Muir? I'm, I'm t <laughs> like I said, man, military coups. Military coups, military-led states are not the best, man. Because every, because it's just a terrible system because it leads to, to dictatorship and it leads to absolute power. And I'm telling you, absolute power countries, the citizens usually are not living the best. I mean, uh, besides when most of them are not influenced by, the ones who are not influenced by the propaganda and the ones who are not just Oh, I'm happy to live here. I'm, this is our great leader. You know, you know what I mean. Those type of people, military-led states and dictatorships, are not the best. Are not good forms of government. They're not. In 1802, he was earmarked to lead an expedition to recover the French territory of Louisiana, but it was called off when Napoleon decided instead to sell Louisiana to the United States. Victor and Marshal Lannes were close friends from their days serving together in Italy. In 1806, Lannes persuaded Napoleon to let him have Victor as his new chief of staff for Fifth Corps. Napoleon agreed, and in October, Victor served as Lannes' deputy at the Battle of Jena. Napoleon's earlier misgivings about Victor were now forgotten, and that winter he was given command of the newly formed Tenth Corps. But within weeks, he was captured by a Prussian patrol, and had to be exchanged for a captured Prussian officer, General von Blücher. His big break came in 1807, stepping in for the wounded Marshal Bernadotte to command 1st Corps at Friedland, where he successfully led a major attack as the Emperor looked on. Promotion to Marshal, and the title Duke of Bellumo, swiftly followed. In 1808, Marshal Victor and 1st Corps took part in the invasion of Spain, where he'd be posted for the next three years. Victor's record in Spain was better than most, but like others, he seemed more interested in personal glory and rewards than in cooperating with fellow commanders. So, it's uh, the, the, iron, the irony. So people are concerned about personal glory, but not Napoleon's personal glory, their own. Uh, we, we don't approve of Napoleon becoming a military dictator, but hey, I still want military achievements and glory in war. Like, you gotta, you gotta choose one, you know? Either you're, for, either you're for the country or you're for yourself, you know? In 1809, at Medellin, he inflicted a crushing defeat on General Cuesta's Spanish army. Four months later, his bold night attack on the British at Talavera came tantalizingly close to success. He was furious the next day when King Joseph and Marshal Jourdain refused to support fresh attacks and instead ordered a cautious withdrawal. The next year, Victor besieged the Spanish port of Cadiz. It proved a lengthy, futile operation, devoid of glory and saw his troops defeated by an allied sortie at the Battle of Barossa. They, they, didn't, they didn't have much success in Spain anyway, to be honest. They, they, Napoleon didn't have the, the, the most success in Spain, so you can you really... That was just a casualty of just the Spanish were just... The Spanish was... They brought the smoke, you know? And that's, what it, that's what it was. In 1812, Victor was recalled from Spain for the invasion of Russia. His Ninth Corps was held in reserve for most of the campaign, though his troops were kept busy defending depots and convoys from Cossack raids. That autumn, his corps attempted to cover the main army's retreat from Moscow. The greatest crisis of the retreat came at the Berezina River. As the remnants of the Grande Armée began crossing over two improvised bridges, Victor's Ninth Corps was ordered to form the rearguard. Though heavily outnumbered, Victor skillfully handled his French and German troops, 
holding the Russians at bay as the army made its escape. He then marched his surviving troops over the bridges in good order. A courageous performance in desperate circumstances. In Germany in 1813, Victor commanded 2nd Corps, and led the attack in Napoleon's last great victory at Dresden. His corps was in heavy fighting again at Leipzig two months later. Victor continued to serve at the Emperor's side in the defence of France in 1814. By now, like many comrades, he must have been close to physical and psychological exhaustion. Regardless, during the Battle of Montereau, Napoleon let fly at him for failing to get his troops into position, and blamed him for the Allies' escape. Victor was relieved of command, but angry and humiliated at what he considered his unfair dismissal, he told the Emperor, Marshal Victor has not forgotten his old trade. I will shoulder a musket and take my place in the guard. Moved by this response, Napoleon relented and gave Victor command of a corps of young guard. So you get embarrassed, so you get embarrassed, and you get dismissed unfairly. It wasn't even really your fault. It was just, he blamed it on you. And then you're going to come crawling back, begging for a position in the... I mean, I understand that's all they knew back then, because they were, they were lifetime... <clears throat> That's all he knew because they were lifetime soldiers. But, bruh, come on. Like, come on now. You, you can't go out like that. Two weeks later, he was badly wounded at the Battle of Craon and took no further part in the war. A month later, Napoleon abdicated and Victor switched his loyalty to the Bourbon monarchy with surprising zeal. He led an investigation into former comrades who'd supported Napoleon during the Hundred Days, and was one of only two active marshals to vote for the death penalty for Marshal Ney, a decision he later claimed to regret. Victor later served as Minister of War, but retired from public life in 1830, following the overthrow of the Bourbon monarchy. 10. Marshal Murat I cannot conceive how I cannot conceive how so brave a man could be so unreliable. He was only brave when facing the enemy. In council, he was a fool with no judgment. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> Joachim Mira, the son of an innkeeper, was destined for a career in the church, but dropped out of college and joined a cavalry regiment instead. To his immense frustration, he saw little action in the early years of the Revolutionary Wars, being stuck with staff and training roles. But in 1795, while stationed in Paris with the 21st Chasseurs, fate intervened. A young general, Napoleon Bonaparte, had been put in charge of the defence of the National Convention. With a mob poised to storm the building, he ordered Captain Murat to bring him cannons, which he did, racing the guns through the city streets, allowing Napoleon to mow down the mob with a famous whiff of grape shot. Napoleon was hailed as the saviour of the government and rewarded with command of the Army of Italy. Murat was promoted colonel and went with him as his new aide-de-camp. Oh, so he was with he was with Napoleon from the jump. So yeah, I I received rec you know what I'm saying I like he was with him from the jump. So obviously it's going to be some type of favoritism included when he wants to make a marshal because like oh you was with me when I first got command of the army. So you know it's always just going to be a little bit of favoritism. It's going to be a little bit of uh, like a little bit of he he got he got a lot more clout with Napoleon than a lot of other people. You know. He soon made a name for himself as a bold and brilliant leader of cavalry. While his six-foot height, curly locks and love of women ensured fame as France's foremost beau sabreur. Bro, they, they, they thought six foot was extremely tall back then? Wow. <laughs> Yo, I would have been, I would have been Jesus. I was, I'm six three. I would have been Jesus back then. Oh my goodness. <laughs> In 1798, Murat joined Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. A 
At the Battle of Abu Kir, his flanking charge broke the enemy, and Murat personally took the Ottoman commander prisoner, despite being shot in the jaw, a wound which, to his immense relief, did not ruin his looks. Back in Paris, Napoleon launched his coup d'etat to seize oh, so he was a pretty boy. <laughs> political power. When he got a hostile reception from the Council of 500, it was Murat who saved the day, leading troops in to clear the chamber, shouting, Citizens, you have been dissolved, before adding something a bit more coarse. His place at the future Emperor's side was further assured when he married Napoleon's youngest sister, Caroline. Oh in yeah, oh yeah, he are, yeah, yeah, he's in there. Yeah, he he are, he was there from the jump. He married his sister, he went to him to Egypt. Oh this man Murat, man, he he got he got all the clout. All the clout with Napoleon. <laughs> 1800. Power move. Later that year he commanded the French cavalry reserve at Marengo and helped Napoleon to win a decisive victory over the Austrians. When Napoleon established his empire in 1804, Murat became a marshal, second in seniority only to Berthier. He'd later also receive the title Prince of the Empire, and the rank of Grand Admiral. In the 1805 campaign, he commanded Napoleon's cavalry reserve. His excellent reconnaissance and diversions proving crucial in the encirclement of General Mack's Austrian army at Ulm. Three weeks later, Murat and Marshal Lann, who normally couldn't stand each other, together bluffed an Austrian commander into surrendering a vital bridge by persuading him that an armistice had been signed when it hadn't. <laughs> Yo, he just finessed! Oh my god, did they just finesse the mess? They just finesse the crap out of that dude. <laughs> How you convince somebody to be a. <laughs> Bruh, that's crazy. They just, they just, they told dude, you know what? We, 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 we had a ceasefire. Ain't no guns being fired. Then we just come in and just take the whole. Bre <laughs> it was a bold stunt. But overall, Napoleon was not impressed by Murat's pursuit of the enemy. I cannot approve your manner of march. You go on like a stunned fool, taking not the least notice of my orders. Yet in battle, Murat remained a brilliant and inspiring leader, as demonstrated at Austerlitz, and the next year at Jena, where he led the decisive charge, wielding only his riding crop. The next year, at Eilau, with the Russians poised to break through his centre, Napoleon ordered Murat to lead a mass cavalry charge straight at the enemy. Murat's men succeeded and saved the army from disaster, though at a terrible price in men and horses. Napoleon had rewarded Murat in 1806 by making him sovereign prince of the Grand Duchy of Berg. In 1808, he sent Murat to Spain to act as his representative. Spain was still a French ally, but in May, Napoleon's heavy-handed meddling in Spanish affairs triggered a ferocious backlash. Madrid rose up against the French garrison, and Murat's troops fought back with brutal force, killing around 200, executing 300 more. When Napoleon deposed Spain's Bourbon monarchy, Murat hoped he'd be made the new King of Spain. But that title went to Napoleon's brother, Joseph. Murat instead received the throne of Naples. If it felt like second prize, it wasn't bad going for an innkeeper's son, college dropout and ex-cavalry trooper. Napoleon expected Murat to merely represent his interests in Naples, but Murat had other ideas. He reformed the Neapolitan army, equipping it with splendid new uniforms, and turned a blind eye to smuggling, which undermined Napoleon's economic war against Britain, the so-called continental system. See, I'm telling you, a lot of these people, Napoleon made a lot of enemies, and I, and I that's the second one that I've seen that has 
like gone on to get to get their own country and then to defy Napoleon's orders. It was the one I forgot who it was, but he was like he became like some huge leader in Denmark and then he became it was either Denmark or Sweden. No, it was Finland. It was Finland. It was Finland. And he be, and he became part of the big the big like the sixth army, the big army that was gonna destroy Napoleon once and for all. That's just crazy how a lot of some a lot of his people came back to bite him in the butt after everything was said and done. Like this you know what I'm saying? Just it's 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 loyalty, but then it's no loyalty in war, you know what I mean? Relations between Murat and the Emperor became strained. But when Napoleon began planning to invade Russia in 1812, only Murat would do to lead his cavalry. Their differences were put to one side. Murat took command of four cavalry corps and became Napoleon's second in command. During the advance into Russia, Murat's cavalry faced a difficult and frustrating task, trying to locate the enemy in a vast landscape. Horses died in their thousands from poor fodder and exhaustion, and they faced a dangerous and wily opponent in Russia's Cossacks. Murat, always riding with the advance guard, was so fearless and conspicuous in his extravagant uniforms that the Cossacks came to admire him, calling out, Ura, Mura!" whenever they saw him, and hoped to capture him alive if possible. Mura was among those who tried to persuade Napoleon to halt the advance at Smolensk, but was ignored. That, that man was gung ho. He said, "He said, forget your advice. I gotta go because th at this point, it's no turning back. Because you didn't try to invade several countries. You've already invaded Russia, so there's no turning back. Why would you? Why would you try to hold off now?" At the great clash between the French and Russian armies at Borodino, Mura was at his best directing a series of attacks on the Russian earthworks, always where the action was hottest, inspiring all with his courage. Murat remained with the army during the retreat from Moscow, though his magnificent cavalry had virtually ceased to exist. One eyewitness noted that throughout the ordeal, he never neglected his appearance. Even at the Beretsina he looked splendid, in an open-necked shirt, velvet cloak, a white feather in his cap. <laughs> Yo, my man was swaggy. <laughs> my man was swaggy, had the little, had the little animal fur with the velvet and the little, my man was trying to be swaggy out on the battlefield. I can't even be mad. <laughs> when Napoleon left the army to return to Paris, he gave command to Marshal Murat. But Murat, now primarily concerned with hanging on to his kingdom, left the army a month later, and returned to Naples, where he opened secret negotiations with the coalition. He offered to join the war against Napoleon, if the other powers would let him keep his crown. But he received only a lukewarm response. So in 1813, when Napoleon asked Murat to join him in Germany, to fight for their thrones together, he answered the call. So he was really, he was basically going to go behind his back, but the people denied his request. Wow, that's crazy. He only joined him on a condition just because he couldn't do what he wanted to do on the other side. That's crazy though. Although Napoleon was, you know, Napoleon was a, a supreme war leader, was one of the most strategic, one of the, one of the best strategists like in war. Bro, some of his generals like. He, he got sold out by a lot of people, man. You can't lie and say he didn't get sold out by a lot. A lot of people was really about to sell him out. Like, Murat was about to sell him out. Only the fact that he couldn't keep Naples was the only reason that he didn't sell Napoleon out. Did, do, you, do I think Napoleon deserved it? Not really. But it's just unfortunate because, like, but the thing is, there's no rules in war. So it's not like... Oh my God! He broke the he broke the secret rule book. Like there's no rules, so like I can't say he wasn't. I can't say oh he, you can't do that. It's terrible, but he, he can do whatever he wants. Mira had become increasingly difficult to work with, oversensitive about his royal status, prone to tantrums, but in battle as fearless as ever. At Dresden, his charge through rain and mud shattered the Austrian left wing and paved the way for victory. 
but then at Liebert Volkwitz, he showed his limitations when not under Napoleon's direct command, getting drawn into a major and unnecessary cavalry battle with coalition forces, and twice nearly being captured himself. Two days later, at the Battle of Leipzig, he led another of history's great cavalry charges, coming close to breaking the enemy centre, and even capturing the Allied monarchs. But it was not to be. The Battle of the Nations ended in a disastrous defeat. As Napoleon retreated to the French frontier, Murat informed the Emperor that he was leaving for Naples, promising to raise fresh troops. Murat and Napoleon would never meet again. Three months later, the King of Naples had cut a deal with the coalition and switched sides. So Man. See, so he so he did it anyway. You might as well have done it you might as well have done it any you might as well have just done it the first time you had a chance. Instead of just waiting until after the whole thing and you was gonna switch sides anyway. Like as long as it was possible for me to believe that the Emperor Napoleon was fighting to bring peace and glory to France, I fought loyally at his side, Murad declared. But now I know that the Emperor's sole desire is war. However, Murad's commitment to the Sixth Coalition was distinctly half-hearted. His army marched against Eugène's forces in northern Italy, but had done no actual fighting before news arrived of Napoleon's abdication. Murat then began to suspect what had been obvious to Napoleon at least. The coalition was not going to honour its promise, and Murat would be next to lose his throne. So in 1815, encouraged by news of Napoleon's return from exile, Murat marched north against the Austrians, proclaiming a war for Italian freedom and independence. Just seven weeks later, his campaign ended in defeat at the Battle of Tolentino. With the British and Austrians closing in, Murat became a hunted fugitive. He sailed to France, but Napoleon had not forgiven his betrayal and refused to see him. After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, he fled to Corsica, gathered a small band of volunteers and returned to Italy, in a hopelessly doomed attempt to start a revolution and reclaim his throne. Chased by a mob and arrested on the beach, Murat was sentenced to death by the restored Bourbon monarchy of Naples. He met his end with his usual courage, telling the firing squad, if you wish to spare me, aim at the heart, then gave the order to fire himself. Mm. That man got killed by his own people, but the thing is, he, he sold he tried. He sold Napoleon out and his own people. Like you got so it really, really his his end was kind of like deserved. Not really deserved, but like the way he served Napo the way he kind of like he the way he did Napoleon. I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> Murat is rightly remembered as one of the great battlefield cavalry commanders of history. Inspirational, fearless, with brilliant tactical instinct. But outside of combat, he was, in Napoleon's estimation, a very poor general. He always waged war without maps. Worse, when the conflict turned against France, he allowed self-interest and vanity to prevail over loyalty to the Emperor. As Napoleon's chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, once told him, you're only a king by the grace of Napoleon and French blood. It's black ingratitude that's blinding you. Mm, you're only a king by the grace of Napoleon and French blood. Really, and plus he married into Napoleon's family and he was just helped. He was just there from the jump. Like, bro, you're at, uh, I don't know, man. This, uh, mm -hmm. Sancerre, Udino, Victor, Mura. 17 down, 9 to go. Join us for part 4 when we'll continue the countdown. Coming soon. Thanks again. Yeah, that man gonna stretch out. That man gonna stretch that content though. I'm not mad at you though. But I like this video, man. This video was very... I like, I like the way he broke down all the generals.
to be honest, I, I learned a lot more than Murat. I learned a lot more about Murat today because I knew I, 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 I knew a little bit. I didn't know it, but like I learned a little bit during the uh, like when Napoleon was Napoleonic Wars during that part. But now I knew like this man was. It's like he was, like he was just kind of like he was two faced in a way, but like he was loyal to Napoleon when it came to battle. But other than that, he was just I don't know. He was a he was a pretty boy. He was a narcissist. He was a he was a he was switch he was switching up. He was switching up on Napoleon, like like it's just he's he's a mixed bag. He's a mixed very mixed bag. Anyway, thank you again for watching. Leave a like if you enjoy. Hit that subscribe button if you're new to the channel. Don't forget to turn on my post notifications if you haven't already. Uh, definitely, uh, thank you again. Please be safe. Have a great day. Stay on the grind. I'm out. Peace.